Okay, guys, chapter nine. Oh, the shame of it, the humiliation. John wept breathlessly as he ran, shocked and frightened, indignant and angry at the world that had suddenly turned against him. Mean old things, John thought, blaming Miss Plimsoll and Mrs. Quaver for his failures, even though nothing had happened to him that had been his fault anyway, had been their fault. Horrible old school, he thought, even though he had liked school until the morning. Hateful Susan, he thought, even though he knew at the same time that he was really longing for her to be friendly with him again. Through the window, Miss Midas saw John coming up the pathway. Hello, John, dear, she called from the living room. You're home early today. How nice. As a reward, there'll be a piece of chocolate after supper. I hate it, John shouted. He was crying too hard to say anything else for a moment. Then she heard the sound of his voice. Mrs. Midas rushed into the hall. Why, what's the matter, dear? She asked, putting her arm around him. John twisted away from her grasp, ran past her, and started up the stairs toward his bedroom. Susan doesn't want me at her birthday party, he said as he went. I know she doesn't. Well, I don't want to go to her rotten old party anyway. I don't think you really mean that, Mrs. Midas said. Besides, she added, and John was halted by the softness of her voice. Mrs. Buttercup just telephoned to say that she was going to drive over herself at four o'clock and pick you up. She did, John said, blinking down at his mother from the top of the stairway. Yes, she did, Mrs. Midas assured him. So you'd better hurry and get yourself washed and brushed. Your party clothes are laid out on your bed. There were games on the buttercup's lawn while it was still warm enough outside. Later, the party supper, including the birthday cake, was going to be served indoors, and there would be a magician and a short movie. John looked in the blind man's buff and grandmother's footsteps and fox and geese, and soon he became more cheerful. John joined in. Those must be games. Remember we talked about this as an old-fashioned story? Grandmother's footsteps and fox and geese. I haven't heard of those. But think about it. At one time, hide-and-seek was an, uh, a new game, and now it's been played forever. So at one time, fox and geese, what, that was a game. Susan looked very pretty. I'm sorry, did I read the last sentence? He even temporarily forgot about chocolate. Susan looked very pretty. Her yellow curls had been brushed so hard that they looked silkier than ever. She was wearing a big blue ribbon, the same color as her eyes. Her cheeks were flushed with excitement, a deeper pink than her party dress. On her feet were dainty little white socks and white shoes with straps that buttoned. Between games, Susan smiled at John and said, I'm glad you came. They seem to be on good terms again. Then Mr. Buttercup approached, bringing a bucket of water from the garage. He set it down in the middle of the lawn without spilling a single drop. We're going to duck for apples, Susan whispered to John, the boys against the girls. You can be the captain of the boys team. The two teams lined up for the race, Susan leading the girls and John the boys. The idea is this, Mr. Buttercup explained. When I say go, not yet, John. Susan and John will run to the bucket. There are 12 apples floating in the bucket and 12 people in the race. Using only their teeth, Susan and John will grab their apples and run back to the lines. As soon as they touch the hands of the number two runners in their teams, Dinny and Duncan, Susan and John will go to the end of their lines, and Dinny and Duncan will run to the bucket and duck for apples. Does everybody understand how it's going to work? All right. One, to get ready. Two, to get steady. Three, two, go. Susan bounded ahead like a jackrabbit. 
and had her face deep in the bucket by the time John reached her side and crouched down for his apple. He got his eye on a big red one with a stalk jutting up conveniently for him to grab. He lowered his face, opened his mouth, and lunged. Somehow his nose reached the apple before his teeth did and pushed it below the surface of the water. John's mouth followed the apple down. Then a terrible thing happened. Do you know what happens? The clear water in the bucket turned to a dark brown sweet liquid chocolate. Susan and John immediately pulled their heads up, but it was too late. Their faces were drenched in chocolate syrup. Oh! Susan exclaimed, wiping chocolate out of her eyes. Chocolate syrup dripped down all over her delicate pale pink dress. Oh! she moaned. John was in the same state. There was chocolate all over his face, and there was chocolate on his white shirt front and on his gray flannel shorts, and there was chocolate in his mouth. John said, Susan was too surprised and angry to speak. For the second time that day, she turned her back on John and ran away from him. Mrs. Buttercup offered to clean John up, but he couldn't bear to stay at the party another minute. He started off at once for home. Here's the picture. Have you ever seen apple bobbing? You're supposed to stick your face in there, but usually it's water. You try to grab the apple with your mouth, but when the apple, when the water touched John, it turned to chocolate. Ew. That was chapter nine.